no Mickey show. The no Mickey show. Yeah. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed, deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and it's melted by we live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights, highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. The No Miki Show.
momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from a leech, only God stay fed. Deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and it's melted by we live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights, highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. The No Mickey Show. Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. It is Friday, January 21st. Officially, it has been a year since Joe Biden was inaugurated, uh, one year into his presidency, and there's a lot to discuss, but was there all that much to comment on, meaning like accomplished? This is the big question right now. Uh, Joe Biden, of course, ran as the stable candidate, the one who was going to be the alternative to the far right to bring democracy back. Uh, you know, he talked about being able to work with conservatives and Republicans in Congress, uh, that bipartisanship was the way we were going to get through this crisis and that we would have less extreme partisanship in this country. But it, it doesn't look like that actually is happening, whether he's trying or not is one thing, but you know, it might just be that our country is too far gone. It is the, the partisanship is too extreme. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think that working people, as we all know, have been abandoned by most of our government over the last four decades. The Democratic Party is not necessarily uh, reflective of a working person's party. There are definitely working people in the Democratic Party, but they're not the ones who are in power. They're not the ones calling the shots. Uh, now you see, you know, over the last, I'd say, six years, since since the uh, the primary between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, you've seen a lot of folks wake up. Of course, it didn't start with that primary, but it really accelerated, at least in the political class. You have folks who decided to support Bernie Sanders instead of the establishment Democrat, uh, Hillary Clinton. And then a couple of years later, you saw waves of progressives run in 2018, run and win, run again. In New York, we had a legislature that turned uh, from, from being a very, very neoliberal legislature that was working directly with Republicans to becoming uh, a Democratic legislature that is, in the Senate in particular, uh, progressives rule the, the Senate. <laughs> but that happens every couple of years, a different group of people becomes woke to progressive working class politics. I have great news for you all. Hear me out on here. It's finally hitting the donor class. When the donor class is like, oh, wow, the Democratic Party is not what it really seems to be when they're pitching us. When they're upset, you know things are about to shift. When the view, when the view comments on how Joe Biden is not doing enough and he needs to stop working with Republicans, you know things are about to go down. So hours from now, the Senate will begin the votes on the voting rights reform bill, which hinges on challenging filibuster rules, something that Democratic Senators Sinema and Manchin still say they oppose. So some Democrats say, well, you may oppose it, but we are going to primary you behind in 2024 mm. if they prevent this bill from passing. But Manchin seems unfazed. Take a look. I've been primary my entire life. That would not be anything new for me. I've never run an election. I wasn't primary. This West Virginia. It's just rough and tumble. <laughs> We're used to that. So bring it on. Oh. Yes, well, it, it's never been quite as rough and tumble as this because you see when you say to poor people and basically that's what you're doing, we don't care how you vote. You'll vote how I tell you to vote. Poor people don't like that. Mm -mm. They don't like it. And so you might have been set before and you could do rough and tumble. Let's see how rough and tumble you actually are. How do you see this playing out? It's fascinating that that uh, Bernie Sanders considers them Democrats. Because yeah. I don't. Yeah. You know, but I, I was just saying before uh, to you, 
that I think that Manchin's, ha, Manchin has shown some of his cards that we didn't see before, sort of what you were just sort of saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we now know that he's in bed with the coal industry and the fossil fuel industry, that his daughter, this is an interesting point, mm -hmm. his, um, his daughter was the CEO of the pharmaceutical company that was caught gouging the price of EpiPens a few years ago That's and terrible. making big donations to his campaign at the same time. This is a guy who basically doesn't want the poor people in yeah. his state Mm -hmm. to have a child tax credit because he thinks they will use the money for drugs yeah. and uh, he doesn't want paid sick leave because it might encourage people to lie so they can go on hunting trips why are the West Virginians putting up with this why will yeah. they put yeah. up with this man who doesn't give a hoot about them mm -hmm. the environment or the Democratic Party or the country at this point yeah. donors are now saying that they're not going to give to Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema anymore. Groups that have supported them in the past, like Emily's List, are now saying if if Kirsten Sinema continues this behavior, they're no longer going to support her, partly because their donors said, we are not giving to Emily's List if you continue to support Kirsten Sinema. And then the most elite group of donors, as New York Times reported a couple of months ago, they said, unless Joe Biden takes voting rights seriously, they're no longer giving to the Democratic Party. They're on strike. Will be will this be the moment when the establishment starts to listen on 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 the eve of Joe Biden's one year anniversary into being president? he gave a very long press conference. The press has been angry because he has not been appearing in press conferences. Well, he made up for it because he gave the longest press conference in history as president. Uh, and I watched it. And let's just roll this real quick, uh, this little snip from, from the press conference on BBB, the Build Back Better Act. That you're confident yes. that major chunks of Build Back yes. Better can pass. Are you breaking it up? Does that yes. Mean? Well, uh, it's clear to me that, uh, um, that we're going to have to uh, probably uh, break it up. Um, I think that we can get, and I've been talking to a number of my colleagues on the Hill, I think it's, it's clear that we would be able to get support for the, for the 500 plus billion dollars for uh, energy and the environmental issues that are there, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I know that uh, the two people who've opposed on the Democratic side, at least, um, support a number of the things that are in there. For example, Joe Manchin strongly supports early education, three and four years of age, strongly supports that. Well, so they say that, right? And this is this is this is their game now is, OK, well, Joe Manchin, you support this, then show us. We're going to break these bills up and we want to see it, because when you lump them all into one bill, it's very hard to message. People don't I think people understand that Bill Back Better is very important for the economic recovery of this country. But most Americans may not know every single piece of this bill. And if you break it up now. Now it can be embarrassing for Joe Manchin when he says he was for that and now he's against it because you know that's what's going to happen. And it's also harder for lawmakers to be influenced by certain parties. So when you have it all in one bill, the pharmaceutical industry might be against reducing pharmaceutical costs, but they're tanking the whole bill as a result. Or the real estate industry may be against eviction moratoriums that might be included in the bill or whatever. I mean, there's there's so many different issues. So one interest can tank an entire bill. So if you break it up, those interests are definitely going to be present for each of those individual bills, but not as powerful. With that being said, I don't believe the buck stops at Joe Manchin or Kirsten Sinema. Uh, I was quoted in a piece in NBC a couple of days ago. Let's put that up. It came out yesterday uh, where they asked from multiple different folks, uh, Jonathan Allen from NBC, he's the author of Shattered, if you forgot that uh, that book on, on the Hillary Clinton uh, presidential run. Uh, Jonathan Allen asked different folks in the Democratic Party where they stood and on uh, Joe ba Biden's record long press conference. And, you know, I, I gave a long, I'll give you my full quote that didn't really make it in, but just so you guys know what I, what I actually told him. Um, and, and this is, this is, I thought about it because I had a couple of different takes on this, but this is basically what I said to him. 
The stakes are too high for performance politics. Great on President Biden for holding a record long press conference, but until he seriously champions the PRO Act and uses his pen to eliminate student debt, I worry the Democrats will lose a generation to the far right who has invested in every corner of this country. The administration is still acting incrementally in response to the economy and has been slow in basic pandemic response as we saw with the at-home test debacle. Austerity should not be the answer when working people are in the worst spot that they've been in decades. Biden needs to channel LBJ and not let Manchin and Cinema ride his agenda. But simultaneously, he has executive power that could keep Democrats in office with the ability to get us out of this crisis. The buck does not stop at Joe Manchin. It's with President Biden. And I say that because, you know, rightfully so, we are, are very frustrated with Manchin and, and cinema. But, but with that being said, there are levers that could hold them accountable, which I think they're they're trying to do in a more, you know, by breaking up the bill. Um, but Senator Schumer has a lot of power, committee power, investigative power, because Joe Manchin, of course, uh, <laughs> has his own conflicts. And then, of course, President Biden has the power of the pen. I think so many folks are worried that if we don't pass this, the Democrats are going to lose the Senate and the House. And then we're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're going to have a lot more Madison Cawthorns or Hawthorns, whatever you <laughs> You're going to have a lot more uh, Lauren Bobarts in office if they don't pass something. But if they don't pass something, they can simultaneously do so much with the power of the pen. When we talk about eliminating student debt, we're not even talking about the private debt. This is just federal debt. This is what he, with a signature, he can transform a generation, can empower them, give them the ability to live. I mean, I'm a millennial. I'm almost 40 years old. And I don't know a world without student debt. And I know so many others feel that way because you got to pay that debt first before you pay your bills. If we want a stronger country, that, that is something that Joe Biden can have as his legacy. And I hope he does it before the election. And there's so much more he can do. He says he's he's supportive of unions, the PRO Act, go and champion it, campaign for it. This will transform the country. It'll empower unions. It'll make it so that the Democratic Party is vibrant again and stronger. So with that, uh, we have many fights ahead of us at once. Biden can do much more much, much more, and we should be pressuring him to do so. We have an extraordinary show today. As always, it's Femme Friday. You guys know we love Femme Friday. We have Reverend Jennifer Butler on. Uh, Jennifer, Re Reverend Jennifer Butler is the CEO of Faith in Public Life. We are going to be talking about the religious right and the connection between January 6th, the insurrection that happened, and uh, Christian nationalism and what faith communities can do. And then later we have Julia Rock from the Daily Poster. Uh, she's going to be talking about some of the stuff that's happening in the progressive movement. You know, there's all these uh, progressive organizations that have launched. How are they working together? How are they fighting? It's it's an interesting story of how power uh, works on the progressive side. And later we have Esperanza Fonseca. We're going to talk about some of the stuff in the news today, especially around organizing. We will be right back after this break. to tell you, um, Sunset Lake CBD has really transformed the way that I function in the world. I'm not going to lie. Uh, Sunset Lake CBD has helped me with my sleep, staying asleep, going to sleep and staying asleep. I don't go to bed easily and I don't stay asleep. I'm tossing and turning constantly. Last night, I slept much better than the night before. The night before, I was tossing and turning and I never woke up and, and poured myself some Sunset Lake CBD tincture. Uh, but I did last night and I slept much, much better. It has changed my life. Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer-owned company. They are in Vermont. They actually uh, started off from a dairy farm, an old dairy farm from Ben & Jerry's in Vermont, and they decided to grow premium hump by diversifying that farm. 
it's a sustainable, you're supporting sustainable agriculture when you are supporting them as well as rural economies. They are creating meaningful employment in their community in Vermont. They pay their workers a $15 minimum wage. And on top of that, their employees are the majority of their company while they're supporting shows like our show, The Majority Report, and David Packman's show. They have a deal for you right now. If you go to sunsetlakecbd.com, type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, you will get 20% off of your entire order. They have tinctures. They have lotions. They have dog biscuits. I talk about the dog biscuit all the time because my dog, Bijou, is a little terrorist. <laughs> He's He may be 14, I believe, almost 14, uh, but he terrorizes everyone all the time. He has... Uh, anxiety when he's left alone and you know oftentimes we'll come home from whatever and we'll find that there are tissues everywhere he's broken in into the garbage or you know we watch him on the video camera and he's like chasing his tail around i don't know what he's doing he's always he's digging oh my god the digging he digs 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 or he hides under the bed and doesn't leave but you know what we did we started giving him cbd before the dog biscuits and it calmed him down he would just he was just mellow so now they have dog biscuits. You throw in a dog. Humans could eat them too. I've been told that uh, that sometimes Sam Cedar does that. But they're made with peanut butter, just three simple ingredients. And essentially, you just give one to your dog and they chill out. They're not sleepy. They just chill out. They're not full of anxiety. And then he's much more loving and I can uh, pull him out from under the bed because if I ever try when he's not on CBD, he tries to bite my hand off. <laughs> Go to sunsetlakecbd.com, type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, you'll get 20% off of your order, sunsetlakecbd.com. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Jennifer Butler, uh, Reverend Jennifer Butler, is an expert on the religious right. Uh, she is the executive director uh, and founder of, a founding executive director, excuse me, and CEO of the Faith in Public Life, which works to change the narrative about the role of faith in politics. Uh, and she's also the author of Who Stole My Bible and Born Again, the Christian Right Globalized, which calls for a Christian a religious uh, response to global culture wars of the religious right. And if there's any time we should be really examining this, it's now after we've had an insurrection. And uh, Reverend Butler, thank you for joining us uh, and for, for doing this great work. <laughs> I, I have to full disclosure. I have family members. I'm I'm Greek Orthodox, my background. Um, and I have I have family members who so if anybody knows anything about uh the Greek Orthodox faith, it is it's pretty um it's pretty old school, it's pretty traditional. And even in that <laughs> upbringing, I have two family members on my dad's side of the family who um moved to the south in Virginia in particular, one of them, the other in Florida who were radicalized by the evangelical community and are on the far right. I was like, I don't know how much more religious you could get than Greek Orthodox, but they somehow found a way and and it has become their politics, uh, aggressively so. Um, I, I, you know, I know this is common, but I personally find it horrifying and have to deal with it regularly. But, you know, when did, when did this all start? How... How did it go from being like everyone's just practicing in faith-based communities to becoming a political movement? That's a really great question. It's great to join your show. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Um, and I have a similar story to yours. You know, I grew up in the South in the Bible Belt, and a lot of my relatives and friends have gotten swept up into this movement. What happened, um, and many people have lost sight of sometimes, is that in the 1980s, the Republican Party, many of the operatives were trying to figure out a way to you know, gain political ground. And what they did was poured millions of dollars into creating the Christian right. And what they drew on was um, uh, white Christian Southern resentment of school desegregation. Mm. So really the Christian right was founded in racism. 
Mm -hmm. And they cloak that with the issue of abortion, which was um, for evangelicals, mm -hmm. not even an issue that they opposed um, back in the back in the 70s. They actually supported Roe. Um, mm -hmm. So many of us have lost sight of that. We don't um, sometimes haven't really kind of realized that the Christian right wasn't founded um, so much in religious fervor in some respects, but actually in opposition to desegregating public schools. So let's get to the evangelical community. Um, what is, I mean, for, for folks, I mean, how, how do you, what's the difference between Southern Baptist and evangelicals? Oh, that's interesting. There's um, a lot of overlap and evangelical is someone who takes the Bible seriously, believes it's the word of God, who believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, probably tends to um, attend church regularly as opposed to like on the high holy days. It takes, you know, attending church very seriously a couple of times a week. Um, and I, I grew up among evangelicals in the South in the Bible Belt. Um, and I can say that, you know, as I was growing up, um, most of them were not radicalized. They were just like very committed to their faith, you know, and took the Bible very seriously. And it was not until the 80s and I was coming of age in high school, I watched many of my friends getting grabbed by this kind of hard, harder core ideology around a narrow set of issues that weren't even mentioned in the Bible. Issues like being quote pro-life or really just anti-choice, anti-abortion. And I remember as a young person thinking, like, you know, Jesus talked a lot about bringing good news to the poor and freedom to the oppressed and being a peacemaker. Where is that Jesus? None of my friends are talking about that Jesus. And that was actually what I was drawn to as a young person. I was concerned about the racism I saw in my community. I was concerned about the potential of nuclear Armageddon. And I wanted us to talk about that aspect of scripture. Unfortunately, a lot of people were becoming politicized. Mm. Um, and so it was an effort to draw on religious fervor and, and use it to politicize people and draw them into a Republican party. So um, evangelicals go back really far in American history, but starting in the, the 80s, um, they got drawn into a sort of partisan version of what it meant to be evangelical. So the abortion fight, um, I mean, it's becoming, I mean, literally, to, I believe today is is the anniversary, if, I, if I'm correct, um, right. of Roe v. Wade. With that being said, you know, when this ruling occurred, did the, did the origins of the evangelical um, politicization of of abortion access, did that start before Roe v. Wade or how did that kind of form? That started after Roe v. Wade and uh, Catholics were opposed to abortion, but evangelicals were not. You can even Google uh, the Southern Baptist Convention position on Roe back uh, when the decision was made. And it was really a balanced position around trusting women's moral authority and conscience um, and, um, and, and really taking the decision seriously, but allowing women to make a choice about abortion mm -hmm. and whether or not to have one. Um, and then that position um, began to get really politicized. There's actually a great um, biography of Jerry Falwell in which it documents how hard political operatives had to work to convince Jerry Falwell, one, that mm -hmm. the issue of abortion would matter to his flock, and then two, to become more political because he didn't want it to compromise the ministry he was doing, he thought it might be unpopular. So political operatives, um, namely Paul Weyrich, who's really well known for having, you know, helped lay the foundations for the more extreme um, uh, orientation of the Republican Party. He was one of the key people in making that happen. Hmm. And and when they did influence Jerry Falwell uh, and others, what, what happened? It was just through the ministry, through the preaching that suddenly folks turned? Is that how it was organized? Well, yeah, there was millions of dollars, um, mainly from corporate donors who had an interest in reversing the New shocked. Deal. <laughs> shocked, shocked that it was that. The real motivation was um, to really to reverse the, the New Deal sort of philosophy that had really shaped American policies and to deregulate um, environmental regulations and banking regulations. So it really was to um, serve elite economic interests. And so millions of dollars were poured into Jerry Falwell's operation. And um, there was the creation of other groups like Susan B. Anthony List and Concerned Women for America, focused on the Family Family Research Council. All these groups were uh, brought to scale 
radio stations, Christian radio stations. You can go anywhere in the country and, you know, you can always mm -hmm. tune into that Christian radio station. Um, and all of that was, um, you know, to sort of indoctrinate and educate evangelicals, white evangelicals, who should be explicit there, white evangelicals, white Catholics, and bring them, um, you know, into the Republican Party so that they could control Congress and control the presidency. So. And, and before this uh, agenda started, what, before this this campaign, what was the makeup? Were evangelicals overwhelmingly conservative? Um, they were not overwhelmingly politically conservative. Um, and, um, you know, even today, there are white evangelicals who are progressive. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's uh, easy, given how hardcore things uh, have gotten to, to, to overlook that. And um, there's, you know, here and there's some movement among women, among young evangelicals who are concerned about how we treat immigrants who are kind of coming our way on issues. And uh, a lot of what my organization does is actually try to reach in and talk to those folks and give them a new home and a new way to move forward, but while embracing their faith. So, so the end goal is is always political. The end goal is to to gather people in, onto the right um, to build this coalition, this broader coalition. You know, on our show, we we've looked a lot into the insurrectionists and seeing how people have been radicalized, um, especially after the last few years. But uh, we haven't really explicitly looked into the religious angle. I mean, we we see a lot of folks who are drawn in through libertarianism, through the gamer community, through mm -hmm. feeling disillusioned, you know, as as usual. Uh, folks who are in the spiritual movement who be gone, you know, been brought in through like the anti-vax kind of vibes. But religion, um, it's not the end goal. It is a pathway, right? Just to, to be clear. Cor correct. Yeah. I, I think what they've done well is engage different cultural groups. I mean, it's really great that you put it in that context. Um, and actually, as I say in my book, um, uh, Who Stole My Bible? It, uh, the, the right wing has really stolen scripture, stolen Christianity to endorse its um, violent and hierarchical claims in society. And um, actually, scripture is actually a, a mandate for dismantling autocracy, <laughs> working for a democratic society in which truly there is good news for the poor and freedom to the oppressed. That's the whole theme of the Bible. So they really have hijacked mm. uh, the Christian faith. I mean, they've hijacked everything. They've hijacked the the, the yoga community. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 crazy to see how much they're hijacking. Um, or a and if they can't hijack something, you know, it's it's CRT erasing history. Uh, very, you know, it's like jujitsu uh, here. So, so let's talk about January sixth and the insurrectionists. What what were you able to discover? What pathways? What uh, organizing was happening? Yeah. So on January sixth, I mean, there were Christian flags flying high over that crowd. And a lot of the speakers in the rally beforehand quoted scripture, drew on the book of Revelation, which by the way, Revelation has nothing to say about America being some sort of shining city on the hill. Revelation is about dismantling autocracy. It's actually an anti-imperialistic letter written by a man who had been held prisoner by an autocratic regime called the Roman Empire. But nonetheless, they use um, Revelation. And there is this there is this group called the Jericho March. Um, and it was founded actually by Christian right, former Christian right staff with Family Research Council and others. And they really drew on biblical themes to motivate the crowd, which is extremely disturbing to me, you know, as a pastor and antithetical to everything that Christianity mm -hmm. stands for. I was listening to a podcast recently, and it's funny you say this because uh, there was someone on the podcast, um, uh, Conspirituality is the name of the podcast, uh, someone on who's, who grew up in a in, in one of those, you remember in the early 80s, there were all these cult leaders that, uh, you know, doomsday, doomsday cults, and his mother was one of those doomsday cult uh, leaders, and he was watching... Michael Flynn speak, and he goes, oh my God, Michael Flynn stole one of her speeches. It completely out of context, didn't even make sense. I mean, it, it, but they, it, uh, the amount of research you had to do to find that speech and 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 basically steal part of it uh, on January 6th when he was speaking is, is pretty extraordinary. So I'm not surprised uh, that this is, you know, that they've co-opted scripture and, and taken it out of context. Um, what do they think? I mean, when when folks who come from the evangelical world uh, 
come to this rally, what do they think? If there's no doomsday, I mean, is you know, there used to be like a doomsday. Now they're they're thinking they're part of 1776, like a revolution. Mm -hmm. um, how does that overlap? Yeah, so Christian nationalism really is an overlap of um, trying trying to use religious elements and um, overlap that with this idea that um, Christianity is somehow blessed by God, somehow unique. In particular, white Christians are blessed mm -hmm. by God to run and to manage the country. And so they're overlapping sort of patriotic, nationalistic themes with Christian fervor and a sense of morality, give, giving sort of a moral cover to this kind of a violent movement, which actually went into the Capitol and threatened to hang the vice president, threatened to you know kill people, and uh, did le lead to the deaths of many police officers and others. And so, you know, this is all about violence, um, and yet they were whipping up the crowd using you know this intersection of nationalism and religious fervor. Mm -hmm. When when Donald Trump ran in twenty sixteen, uh, you know early on in his race, there were a lot of Republicans and Christians who were skeptical of him because he had been for abortion. He obviously had given to Democrats in the past. Um, he was, you know, New York City conservative, I guess. Uh, but he quickly found his way into uh, working with the evangelical community. What, like, how did that form? And, and, and obviously that's led to where we are today, but how did that form initially? Yeah, you know, um, Donald Trump is not really a particularly religious man. And as you said, he had very little <laughs> with good reason, right? When we look at his, uh, his demeanor and the way, you know, he operates. But, um, he, you know, some of the political operatives arranged a meeting for him with some of the um, evangelical leaders that eventually became a part of his, um, you know, sort of inner circle. And, um, you know, he realized that he could form a powerful alliance with them. I mean, I think Trump is very politically calculating. He realizes what he needs to do to stay in power. His end game is not anything to do, of course, with morals. It's enriching himself and his family and um, being in the limelight. You know, he's an autocrat. Um, but he, he was able to form an alliance with uh, these folks and give them what they wanted. Um, you know, and so the Supreme Court justices that would support, you know, this anti-choice position, his policies on uh, Israel and Palestine, um, so he was able just to kind of give them them pieces that kind of got them really uh, pulled in. Even some of the more moderate folks, you know, there there were, and that being said, there were a number of leading evangelicals, the head of uh, the Southern Baptist Convention um, Advocacy Office, uh, Russell Moore, number of leading evangelicals, the, the, the magazine Christianity Today, they actually opposed Trump and were never Trumpers. Right. Uh, and yet the mainstream, I would say, even further than just like the fringe sort of extreme groups, but a lot of mainstream evangelicals, uh, Trump, because of these actions and because of his alliance um, with some of these Christian right leaders, was able to pull in more support than many people had originally predict, predicted. Okay, so you, men you mentioned Israel. Uh, I, I think most of our audience probably understands this, this uh, relationship with, you know, the evangelical community and returning to uh, the to the motherland. I, I, I can, you, can you explain how this, I've heard my my aunt explain it because she it, took right? a trip there. Um, and it's I was so like, mind boggling because, um, you know, I mean, I, I grew up among um, conservative evangelicals and they were very suspicious of Jews, very suspicious, suspicious of Catholics, anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, okay. um, often racist. Um, and um, yet, um, you know, and, and still are today, but the Christian right believes that um, once Israel is reestablished and the city of Jerusalem is returned uh, to to them, then Jesus will come back and set the world straight again. And so they're all for accelerating that timeline so that Jesus can come back. And uh, ironically, what will happen when Jesus comes back is um, he, he will make everybody convert to Christianity and those that don't convert will be killed and burned oh, in the fire. So just not like a happy ending for the Jewish people. Um, and yet the um, political aims of the Christian right movement converge sometimes with the more um, hardcore nationalistic claims of um, some in, uh, who lead the, um, the nation of Israel. And uh, of course, there's a diversity of perspectives within Israel of how to work for peace for both you know, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, so they're not monolithic by any means, but like those two political goals end up converging in a bizarre sort of way because the beliefs 
are actually very anti-Semitic. When did this strategy begin? Yeah, this began um, in the 70s and 80s, you know, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, they use biblical sort of claims um, to justify it, but nowhere in the Bible is this kind of viewpoint, you know, endorsed. Mm -hmm. Um, the Republican Party a few years ago, I remember reading how the Bush family was uh, very concerned with the, there was an existential crisis, the Republican Party, they were concerned that young people, they were losing young people, and the country was becoming more diverse. And so they, their strategy was become to become a more uh, inclusive party in terms of diversity. Um, you know, they were leaning very heavily on the Latino vote. Uh, obviously, the Cuban community is much more conservative than than others, but that was sort of their strategy. And then comes Donald Trump and just like flips it and reverses it, and the whole strategy is shifted. Is there still this existential crisis in terms of age um, with the Republican Party, and and how does that overlap with the Christian right? I mean, does the Christian right have have the next generation millennials and and Gen Zers, or have enough of them? I guess when you have a map and you're controlling every single piece of government, it doesn't matter, but uh, wh where are they in terms of demographics? This is a really good question. I mean, there's a lot of uh, polling to suggest that they don't have a stranglehold on younger people. Um, and that gives me a, a little bit of hope that we should continue reaching out to those young folks. What also tends to happen is young people who aren't buying into this ideology around Trump and Christian nationalism, they actually um, end up leaving the fold. And so you also see a steep decline in numbers of young people identifying as evangelical. Mm -hmm. And so what we what's hard to track is how many of them actually are leaving that and going into more progressive forms of Christianity. But mm -hmm. some of us who are clergy and pastors and I had a ministry uh, for many years in Washington, D.C., to young people who were what I, I say is coming out of the wilderness. You know, they were coming out of fundamentalism and into a more progressive version of the Christian faith. And um, that is one cause for hope that there is going to be some generational change and we should strive. And that's one of the things my organization does is strive to sort of mentor people and help people understand there's a different way to move forward with the Christian faith and to, to disciple them and bring them into a different kind of politics. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there've been, there've been recent scandals, uh, about these, these big mega church leaders, you know, how much money they're spending, how they use their expenses. Some have been arrested, some have had investigations. Um, how does that play into this? Yeah. You know, there's kind of a blend happening with, uh, with churches, um, also sort of combining with a hyper-capitalistic worldview, you know, which also kind of then blends with this. Uh, nationalistic, patriotic fervor that the that Christian nationalism supports, um, and it's you know it, it, some of this, this becomes a money making business for those leaders, but it also sort of draws off American culture and that like everybody has that dream of becoming super wealthy, right? Which is actually antithetical in some ways to the gospel, <laughs> you know, because there are two thousand verses of scripture about taking care of the poor and uh, a lot about greed in the Bible. Yeah. So um, all of that tends to merge, um, you know, together for people and becomes very attractive, especially in unstable times where things yeah. are changing quickly. I mean, they'll, they'll like, it's like predatory. They'll say things like, you know, give us this check and you'll be saved. Like what? <laughs> it's really horrific. And then there's some people, you know, if there's this connection between like, if you do well, you're blessed by God. If you're sick or you're doing poorly, that you're um, must be immoral and not in line with God. When actually the opposite is true. You know, Jesus said, blessed are the meat, blessed are the poor. The first will be last and last will be first. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's actually the opposite of what the gospel teaches. And it's incredibly spiritually um, demoralizing and um, lacking in compassion. I've mm -hmm. seen so many families destroyed by that kind of a belief system. Interesting. That's that's is are those mega churches doing better than ever? Are they are they in the decline? Like because it seems like those are those are hubs for this organizing that's happening. They are they are and one of uh, Trump's key advisors. Several of them, um, uh, Jeffress and um, uh, Paula Paula White, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. come out of that kind of milieu. Um, and of course that really connects to Trump and his philosophy of, of life, right? Mm -hmm. He's uh, all about showcasing his money and uh, people admire him for that. 
Um, and, you know, as a pastor, I'd say that is hyper capitalism creeping into the Christian faith and um, it's idiot, it's um, idolatry. Hmm. Okay. So where do we go from here? Are, are they, uh, is there, is there any decline? I mean, we talk about generational decline, but you know, a lot of these insurrections, not all of them, but a lot of them were younger. We're, we're probably, you know, millennial and younger. Um, because it was it was a grueling task to go blast the Capitol. Let's just be real. It was, but, but where where are we going from here? What do we do with all this? Yeah. So my organization is organizing across the country. We work with fifty thousand religious leaders who are organizing to protect our democracy and to call out uh, the heresy of Christian nationalism. Um, and I think the more we do that, and our movement has grown more vocal and more prominent um, in recent years, the more people will have um, a different way to go. They'll be able to listen to their better angels. Um, and it's important, really, I think that all of us contest this moral ground. You know, the, the Christian nationalists and the insurrectionists, they're trying to take some sort of moral high ground. And we need to make a case back to the American people that this is actually antithetical to their faith tradition, whatever that might be. So we're making a Jewish argument. We're making a Christian argument. Um, we're making sure Catholics and evangelicals who understand this are speaking out loudly. And we'll be launching an effort at the top of this year to protect our democracy. You know, the window needs to be kept open. And this is a very important election year. A lot of us don't pay attention in midterm election years, but it's critical mm -hmm. that we protect access to the ballot box. And so we're gonna be mobilizing uh, moral messengers and moral leaders to really defend the ballot box legislatively and in person when the election rolls around. Well, especially with voting rights uh, at, at you know at odds right now with our own government that's in power. So many so. threats. So many threats. Nineteen states have passed voter suppression laws, and uh, of course, we weren't able to pass um, the voting rights reform that we wanted to in Congress just now. Um, that that effort just failed. So we're gonna to continue to try to move that forward. And we're working at the state level to make sure that there are no more bad laws passed that would prevent people from accessing the ballot box. This is wonderful. Um, how can people help out if they wanna join your fight? Well, they can join faithinpubliclife.org, sign up on the mailing list. We'll be mobilizing people across the country and we wanna get you plugged in and trained up. Wonderful. Reverend, um, this was such a thoughtful conversation. Love to have you back on as, as things go on uh, and you continue your fight you know, as you're campaigning and, and mobilizing. But uh, Reverend J Jennifer Butler is the CEO of Faith and Public Life. Go check it out. Doing great work in fighting the far right uh, with, you know, bringing them back to reality. <laughs> well, and if you need a book to talk to your relatives around the holidays, get my book, uh, Who Stole My Bible? Reclaiming Scripture as a Handbook for Resisting Tyranny. I will, I will. In that argument. I will send it to them the way that they send me. Let me know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they try to happen too. They and try to save me all the time. time. <laughs> <laughs> my dad, you know, my dad, my my aunt has actually driven my father to be an atheist. Like he says it. I'm I am not. Uh, he declares himself an atheist, and it is absolutely a result of his family going full. That has happened to a lot of people, and I understand it. And I myself almost left the faith. Even as I was studying to be a minister, I got so disillusioned with the hypocrisy. But then there was a turning point where I decided I have to reclaim this faith. I can't let anybody mm -hmm. steal it from me. And it's morally incumbent upon me to make sure that people aren't hijacking my faith. That's great. This is wonderful work, courageous work, and appreciate you uh, being out there. Thank you so much, Reverend. Thank you for having me. We will be right back after this break with Julia Rock. We are just over one week away from your opportunity <laughs> to learn about how to run a progressive campaign as a working class person. Uh, Matriarch is hosting 
a free full day training. It is full day and you have to attend it to get the, you know, the certificate. Uh, but it, this is a, a really different type of training. Matriarch, uh, Matriarch is hosting a training at matriarchtraining.com. Go check it out there, matriarchtraining.com. You sign up if you're a working class woman, if you are working on uh, any campaigns for working class women, or if you're thinking about running for office, this is where you go. Anything from school board all the way to Congress. It's a full day training. You're going to learn about what kind of challenges a working class per person uniquely faces when they're running for office, how to raise money, how to build coalitions, how to get endorsements, who to hire, when to hire them. What is your narrative? What happens when they try to smear you and attack you? We will prepare you for that. It's a full day training. We have incredible speakers, former Speaker of the City Council of New York. Melissa Mark Viverito is going to be speaking. Uh, Lucy Flores, who of course ran for Congress and was a Bernie surrogate, uh, she will be speaking. Uh, we have folks who've been working in this space for decades. Bernie Sanders' own folks who did his ads will tell you what it means to build a great ad. They did the America ad. They're going to be speaking. Cynthia Nixon's going to be talking about how she grew up as a in the working as a working class kid, and of course ran for our office against Governor Cuomo. Uh, she's going to be talking to us. There's so much in this training. We're trying to fit it all in. Get your notebook ready, take some notes, go sign up at matriarchtraining.com, matriarchtraining.com, and uh, we'll see you on Saturday, January 29th. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Julia Rock writes for The Daily Poster. She's a reporter at The Daily Poster, uh, which is a grassroots funded investigative journalism project that covers politics, business, and corporate power. Founded by David Sroda. You know that guy. Uh, she has a piece out right now, actually, in Jacobin uh, titled The Bernie Left is Taking on Machine Politics and Each Other. Oh, I'm so surprised that this sometimes happens. <laughs> Julia, um, before we get to like the the actual story here, why? How did you find this? What what, what interested you about this? Oh, so I I lived in Rhode Island for the past six years or so, and you know, in that time, as you, as you get a sense of from the story, um, the left really emerged as a much more powerful political force, and that was sort of a striking thing to watch up close. Um, you know, I remember in 2020 being at Bernie rallies in Rhode Island totally volunteer organized because there was no uh, paid Bernie staffer there. Mm -hmm. I remember during the the 2020 uh, state primaries feeling for the first time in my life, like, oh, I, I could live in a place where the left is in power. And, and that mm -hmm. was so striking. Um, you know, I'm going to go back even further here, like way further. So 2020, there were a lot of complaints that there were certain offices that were not open for Bernie. And I, I think that was a major um, misstep uh, or they weren't organizing early enough and it was dependent on 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 uh, folks to do it in their community, which is great that they did step up and folks, you know, said, we're not waiting for the campaign to ride into town. We're going to do it. But let's go back like even further, further, further. Um, Rhode Island, of course, well, I don't know if folks know this, there is, there, there is a machine there that still exists. Not every state in this country has a democratic machine. You know, Illinois famously does, uh, Rhode Island famously does, New York, uh, I would say Maryland does, and and uh, and Pennsylvania. Those are probably the strongest machines, unless I'm missing one or two, uh, in this country. Rhode Island always people go, what Rhode Island? Why Rhode Island? Uh, but there is this legacy of of a, a a machine. Maybe like ten or eleven years ago, there was a guy named David Siegel who ran for Congress. He was a state rep. You probably know David, and he was a Green Party member. And I. I think he like deserves a lot of credit for some of this because he started organizing over a decade ago and and of course you know was part of the Bernie campaign and and really it manifested in so many different ways and he called for a lot of the electoral reforms uh, like ending superdelegates when nobody was speaking up about this in you know early 
2015. So fascinating things have been going on in Rhode Island for a while, and it's 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 great to see this work. So with that being said, this story, I like that you mentioned that, that there was no office in, or there's no active campaign happening in Rhode Island for Bernie, because I feel like that created this scenario in some ways. Do, do you feel that that's, that's sort of what led to a lack of consolidation? Yeah, um, that, that might be a fair characterization. I mean, I think it's important to point out that going back to 2016, um, Bernie really stunned in Rhode Island. He beat Hillary Clinton in the primary by 12 points. And a lot of polls had them even or had Clinton ahead. Mm -hmm. All of the statewide uh, Democratic officials had endorsed Clinton. Very few, um, you know, state lawmakers had endorsed Bernie. So he he really stunned in 2016. I think that laid the groundwork for a 2020 where there was a lot of energy around the Bernie campaign. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was all volunteer organized. And I think, you know, part of that was uh, volunteers created this new infrastructure in the state that hadn't really existed before um, for people to be making demands about things like, you know, healthcare for all, um, tackling climate change in a meaningful way, taxing the rich. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what, you know, whether whether the lack of an office is sort of what what uh, made it possible for sort of different orbits of the left to come into being in Rhode Island, I'm not quite sure. But I do think that, you know, the, the context of Bernie energy and especially Bernie energy um, that was sort of not matched by by statewide Democratic leadership is really crucial. Okay, so what's happening? What what? Let's break down what how you discovered this group and what's going on with it. Yeah, so I think that you know an easy place to start is probably the 2020 statewide primaries in Rhode Island, um, when eight progressives unseated incumbent lawmakers and another eight or so picked up open seats. Mm -hmm. And if you sort of dig into how you know, and the Rhode Island, Rhode Island is a tiny state. The the state assembly only has 75 members, so that was sort of a, a massive. Um, windfall in state politics, and if if you look at the groups behind those pri behind those primary victories, there are, there are quite a few of them. So one of them is Reclaim Rhode Island. That is the group founded by the Bernie Volunteers to sort of continue the work of the Bernie campaign at the state level. There's another organization called the Rhode Island Political Co-op, which was also founded quite recently, um, and that's a largely electoral organization focused on you know helping run progressive campaigns. And then there are other, you know, groups that would be familiar um, to folks who watch the show. There's a local DSA chapter. There are lots of Sunrise hubs in Rhode Island. Um, labor unions are really powerful in Rhode Island, especially the, the building trades. Um, so you have this sort of conglomeration of groups backing these candidates. And, you know, from the outside, 2020 just looked like this huge, you know, progressive victory, which, of course, it was. Um, but now that that some of those lawmaker, you know, those lawmakers have ascended to the state house, there are these different groups that have their different policy priorities that they want these lawmakers to be pushing for. Um, there have been, you know, some some splits revealed between different parts of the left, largely along the lines of first, um, you know, how how big of a tent can the Rhode Island left be? You know, if a lawmaker supports a fifteen dollar minimum wage, but not, not a nineteen dollar mi minimum wage. Mm -hmm. You know, is that is that enough for them to be on the left? If if a lawmaker supports really progressive legislation, but votes for incumbent leadership, you know, does that that are they still on the left? Um, so those are sort of the types of questions that that are creating fissures within this broader movement. Um, how much of it is is about? I mean, we, this happens in New York all the time. We're very used to uh, many many left groups, and sometimes they align, sometimes they don't. But usually, it revolves around like, did this person take real estate money, <laughs> or like. Uh, you know, was this person uh, arrested for beating his girlfriend? <laughs> like, true story. These are real things that occur. Um, you know, but, but let's talk about money in particular. Uh, are there and 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 but the, but the the female aspect actually is very important too because I think sometimes we we don't take that into context. Um, it, but sometimes progressives have backed across the country. Some progressive organizations have backed some male candidates that have had real issues when it comes to women. Um, personally or within their offices, and they're overlooked. There are many, many articles written about this. I don't, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But simultaneously, money is always one of those, like, well, they're taking real estate money. Well, you know, they took this corporate money, but they still say they're progressive. Is that one of those dividers? Yeah. That interestingly has not been as much of an issue. I would say first, there's nothing in Rhode Island politics like the issue of real estate money. Like that's such a such a um, smaller part of the campaign finance um, landscape, as well as like there's nothing like fossil fuel money that you know really has a big impact on politics. Um, 
contribution limits are lower in Rhode Island. So it's sort of less of a factor anyways than in mm -hmm. New York. I would say that like the on the campaign side, there's lots of agreement, I think, in terms of like, you know, OK, we're not going to take corporate PAC money. Um, we're going to support a slate of progressive policies. I think that what tends to, you know, um, differ is like the strategy of who, who should we be challenging? This group, the Rhode Island Political Co-op, has sort of made it their policy that any lawmaker in the state house, no matter what policies they support, if they also support state house leadership, the co-op will primary them. Whereas a group like Reclaim Rhode Island is a lot more focused on the issues. What issues do these lawmakers support? You know, do they have a, a, a pro-labor um, stance? Do they are they working with unions? That type of thing. Um, now, the unions you mentioned, how are they in terms of, I mean, notoriously, same thing in New York, if we're going to go back to a state with a strong machine and strong unions, uh, not all unions are the same. And and for the most part, most of the unions don't necessarily support the progressive candidates, at least prior to Cuomo stepping down. So how does that play out in, in uh, Rhode Island? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's an important question. Definitely in Rhode Island, like, like I'd mentioned before, the building trades are, you know, some of the most powerful unions and they have long, you know, had very close ties to, to state house leadership, which, you know, progressives are sort of railing against as too conservative and corrupt. The Senate president um, is, you know, himself a, a member of the building trades right now, but it, 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 um, you know, what you see with these different groups is groups like, you know, the political co-op, even DSA, are sort of more willing to call out unions for being conservative, say, you know, like, we don't need to work with you if you're not going to support these policies. Mm -hmm. Whereas other groups like Reclaim Rhode Island, like the Working Families Party, are sort of looking for issues where they can build broad coalitions that will have union support. So, like, building uh, public housing has been a huge priority of Reclaim Rhode Island and the you know, Working Families Party in, in recent months in terms of um, the legislature. And that is an issue that has has union support. So I think it's it's it, 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 it's sort of a less of a question of, oh, how conservative is this union or how progressive is this union as much as how much a group prioritizes, you know, working on policies that they'll be able to um, get union support for. Interesting. Um is there, when you say there, there, there's friction and sometimes they're against each other, is it, is it the left eating each other alive, that kind of, or is it just sometimes we differ and we don't align? You know, it's interesting. I think if you if you read local media coverage of what's happening in Rhode Island right now, you'll you'll see headlines about it being sort of a civil war. You know, these groups are fighting with each other. They're not getting along. That wasn't my impression, you know, both from living there and from my reporting. I think there certainly have been moments where groups have really come head to head. An example was, um, you know, Reclaim Rhode Island is working with two state lawmakers on legislation to tax the rich and pass uh, binding carbon emissions targets. Mm -hmm. And this fall, the, the Rhode Island Political Co-op announced uh, primary challengers to both of those lawmakers saying, you know, those lawmakers vote for leadership. They're voting for leadership that's never going to support taxing the rich or, you know, binding emission targets. Um, so we're going to primary them. And that was an example of, OK, these groups you know, have clear differences and they're not going to be able to reconcile them. I think in general, they all sort of have the same goal. And it's more a question of, you know, very, very um, different views about how to get there. I mean, it is a question. It, it's a great thing that they bring up leadership, though, because we're seeing this obviously at a much mac on a macro level is that, uh, you know, leadership has the potential to kill, you know, legislation, even if you do have a Cory Bush and, and an AOC who can present the legislation, if the leadership does not allow it to come to the table, you know, you're screwed. But is that at the expense of other pieces of legislation? But if that's what they're building their coalitions around, taxing the rich, then what's the point if it's not going to get there? Yeah, I think I think that's an essential point, you know, and I think there's probably, you know, no, no progressive in Rhode Island who would say, oh, we don't want more progressive leadership, right? And, and, and it's a key feature of machine politics that a few people decide what bills get to the floor. You know, they control a lot of money and dole it out to their friends. In in Rhode Island, if you vote against leadership, you might lose your office in the state house. Like the stakes are very high. I think that where the di disagreement would come is, all right, you know, are we going to be able to win enough races in, win enough elections in a four year period to vote in a new Senate president and house speaker? I think the co-op would say yes. It's going to be up to them to, you know, prove that in 2022. I think other groups are playing a bit more of a long game. Hmm. This is fascinating. Okay, so so some of the takeaway lessons for folks, if you're watching, uh, things that we can learn from Rhode Island, good and bad. 
good and bad. You know, I think that one thing that it seems like Reclaim Rhode Island has done really successfully is choose an issue where they're going to be able to bring a ton of people together around it. And last year, that was taxing the rich. They built a very broad coalition. Uh, they sort of had the rug taken out from under them when the American Rescue Plan passed and a bunch of money went to states, which was great, but sort of made it harder to make the case they were making that taxing the rich was necessary for a pandemic recovery. And now, you know, they have this um, proposal to use some of that American Rescue Plan money to build green public housing. And that's been like one of the few issues, it seems, where you're going to be able to get the trade unions, more conservative Democratic lawmakers, progressive lawmakers, um, all able to agree on something. And sort of the way they came to that issue was knocking on doors and asking people, how do you want the American Rescue Plan money to be spent? And so I think there really is something to be said for choosing really popular issues and trying to build a big coalition around them. And, you know, we'll see how it works out, but it seems to be going well so far. Super interesting. Julia, thank you for, for, you know, going local. I love this stuff. This is how we learn, you know, from other states and we grow. And it, it, these are, I think these are the most fascinating stories. And of course, nobody wants to touch them. So thank you so much for looking into them. Totally. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, it's really exciting to see what's happening there. Great. Julia is a reporter with the Daily Poster, but she wrote this piece in uh, Jacobin. And it's, of course, titled The Burning Left is Taking on Machine Politics. And boy, is there a machine there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. Thanks so much. We will be right back with Esperanza Fonseca. this is an independent show. I don't know if you guys know, but we don't have the Koch brothers money. Um, we don't have oil and gas money. We don't have the grifters fund money that I don't know where they get their sets. Suddenly you look at some of these shows, you're like, I don't know who you are, but you suddenly you have a $2 million set. So who is behind you? Well, I can tell you right now, we don't have hair and makeup. We don't have fancy lights. I have a nice, uh, Ikea desk here that I've set up has lots of space. I've got some box lights that I got for like 40 bucks each and um, a good camera that thanks to our patrons, we were able to do that. Uh, and of course, our killer mic that uh, has saved the day. If you go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show, you will help this show grow. You will make sure that David, our dear producer, can feed himself. And Ruthie, our, our uh, bookings producer, can feed herself, and sometimes I can feed myself. Uh, that is what you are able to provide when you become a patron, uh, patron at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Patrons are really keeping this show alive uh, and keeping it growing so that we can have great guests on, we can have cool graphics, we can do the podcast. All this stuff requires a lot of work. You know, when Bernie Sanders says everybody should do a show online, I don't know if he knows what the costs are. <laughs> uh, it is it is not easy. It is a small business, and you guys are making that possible. So if you can contribute and become a patron, we have all different levels. $5 a start. You can go all the way up. And as you go, there are different uh, perks and features. You can get a mug. You can get a, a bag. You can get a sticker and lots of other things, too. We have exclusives for our patrons. Um, if you are not able to be a patron or if you used to be one, please message us and we will figure this out because when we get a patron like the Rachel Maddow level uh, at 59 bucks a month, you're able to cover another patron. It's a That's what community is. But please email us at thenomikeyshow at gmail.com. Maybe we can throw you a few months for free uh, and we'll check in in a few months or you know, if you really love, love the show and want to hear the whole thing uh, and you want to work with us, we're happy to do so. Patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show. And thanks for all of your support.
All right. Welcome back to Femme Friday on the Nomi Key Show. As always, we are so excited to have Esperanza Fonseca. Esperanza is an Affirm member of uh, the organization Affirm, which is a transnational feminist organization and a labor and policy organizer for, you know, the better part of a decade at this point. Esperanza, hello. Ooh, I'm loving you got the hair change. I like it. Thank you. It's so nice to be back with you and see your face and, and say hi. Happy New Year. So Esperanza. Happy New Year. <laughs> thank you. So I want to, um, there's a lot of news, but I <laughs> want to start off with something a little funny, but actually there's something deeper here. I don't know if you ever watched Sex in the City, uh, the first, you know, the episodes. Yeah. There was this very famous episode where uh, you know, they, they kept, they were in that age when everybody was getting married and they kept having to go to these like baby showers and wedding showers. And of course people got divorced like a minute later. And then you have to go to the weddings and you spend hundreds of dollars and, you know, and, and, and Sarah Jessica Parker, Carrie was single and she was like, why do I still like, why am I paying for this? Why am I paying for your life? And of course she chose not to. So she decided she was going to do her own um, own version of that and have like a, a singles registry. Well, the registry thing is out of control because, of course, capitalism, this is where I'm really like leaning towards here. Um, there is a, this is from the New York Post, so get ready for that. There are two new companies, Fresh Starts Registry and Divorcist. Divorcist. They have sprung up to help recent divorcees put their lives back together one blender at a time, and they have registries for divorce. Late stage capitalism, guys. Late stage capitalism. We will find a way to make money off of every single aspect of your life. I'm still waiting for the singles registry, though, because I do want that. <laughs> what does this represent to you? I mean, just culturally. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things that come up for me when when you bring this up. The first is that uh, there's this idea in capitalist society that if we just consume more and we buy more commodities and we use more commodities, then that is going to help our mental health or elevate our mood. And I think that what it really is, is simply temporary fixes that are never enough. And our money is being wasted on consuming all of these commodities we don't really need and other people are profiting from us. And so once again, I think you're absolutely right. It's just another way to make us into super consumers. Mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, if this person who signs up for this registry is going through a divorce and in this article it's quoted that, you know, suddenly I wake up one day and half of my kitchen's gone. And that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of 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 money to rebuild a household you know there are some goods that you have to function with but if we had a society that let's say paid people fair wages and actually provided support during a pandemic maybe we wouldn't have to be crowdfunding to have a new liver uh, <laughs> or paying for your groceries or whatever it is or divorce bills i mean there's there's so many different aspects of how um this is this is somewhat predatory in a sense Absolutely. I think it is. And I think it's just a way for companies to sort of swoop in and profit off of some of the hardest moments of people's lives, like a divorce. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, okay, so so switching gears, there's a lot of news right now. And I we've done a lot on the BBB, but I, I do want to show this one clip from MSNBC discussing uh, what Biden can get done right now and what Democrats specifically should run on in 2022. <laughs> I mean, we played earlier today a clip from The View of all places. Basically, everyone's been radicalized into becoming Bernie Sanders supporters. I won't say that they're quite democratic socialists yet, but they finally were like, "What?" Whoopi Goldberg was was losing her mind on Biden and uh, the Democrats and saying, you know, they don't do anything once they get elected. So I'm very curious to see what uh, MSNBC has to say if The View has gone that far left. Look, what's possible is possible. And voting rights does not look possible right now and so that converts into an, an, an issue to run on in 2022 on build back better i think there are pieces of it that he can get through uh and not the child tax credit not a free community college uh but other pieces of, of of it that are quite important and that will have a real impact on people's lives um and, and give him new stuff to talk about in addition uh, to what what he's done over the past year. So, um, you know, I think that's the, the field we're playing on right now. I think that the premise here is fascinating, right? You know, Democrats, it, it, converging it with, with 
juxtaposing it with the view. The view is saying, you know, we do everything to get Democrats elected. And then once they're in office, at least the establishment, those who, who are in leadership, don't do anything. And, and then you hear this saying, you know, what the Democrats can run on. It's like to win, to hold power, not what they should be passing, not what, what they should be fighting for and then passing, but what they should run on or what they can pass so that they win. I'm like, I feel like we're like in two different, you know, it's like he needs to like flip his brain a little bit and realize that, you know, human beings are out there and, and actually need to survive. And if they're not surviving, they're not going to vote for you. Well, I think this shows the duplicitous nature that is innate and inseparable from the corrupt Democratic Party. I mean, they run on this so-called progressive platform, which in all reality is not that progressive, right? But uh, they can't even fulfill these small promises that they've made to people. Um, every year, uh, or rather every election year, we're told, just vote for this Democrat and it's going to be better. And in many ways, it's worse. Um, Biden uh, is worse on COVID, in my opinion, than Trump. Biden is worse on, uh, you know, border arrests than Trump. That's not my opinion. That's an objective fact. Uh, child detainees, uh, deportations, um, all of these things have just escalated since he's gotten elected. And all the Democrats care about, as well as their lackeys, like the man that you just showed, um, is simply getting them elected. And then when they're elected, they act no different than Republicans, um, except for a few social issues and, uh, you know, words here and there. And then we're supposed to- Not be being okay insurrectionists. <laughs> That's, that's what I tweeted out last night. Their slogan this year is less insurrection-y. That's it. And, and you know, that's why I think for those of us on the left, no matter how you identify, as long as you attach yourself to the Democratic Party, you are going to continue losing credibility in front of the masses. People are not dumb. People are smart. And they look at this and they know it's another fake promise. And if you support that fake promise, then you become as duplicitous as they do. And that's why I think for us to keep our credibility, we have to be real with people. And that means divesting from the Democratic Party once and for all. It's interesting because it's actually happening with the donor class right now. Like that's how radical, I don't know if radicalized isn't the right word, but but they're waking up to some truths about the Democratic Party that many people were aware of, but you know, through the voting rights in particular. So you have this group of like mega donors in the Democratic Party. You're like, we're not giving money to the Democratic Party until you actually do something about voting rights. Well, guess what? They didn't. So now what's gonna happen? Like their their major funding source is not I'm very curious, are they gonna are, is that a real threat? Like what's happening next? You know, I, I think we'll have to wait and see. But but one thing I do want to say is that, you know, as someone who has done, you know, political work, both in the labor movement in California, but also, for example, the housing movement in Oregon, as well as other places around the country, something that makes me incredibly uneasy and feel very unwell is this idea that our institutions, labor, housing rights, et cetera, they, the model that they use, their theory of change is that we want to buddy up with mm -hmm. democratic politicians so that they will make concessions for us. Mm -hmm. And those concessions are rarely ever made. And it's time for a new strategy, one that understands the need to confront corporate Democrats, not be buddy buddy with them. Yeah. You don't, you don't ask for power. You, you take it. Um, you, you live in Los Angeles, so I have to ask you what's been going on with this recall with Councilmember um, Bonin. Have you been following this? I have not been following that too quickly. Uh, so there was this, and 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 uh, let's put this up on screen. Um, Mike Bonin is a council member, uh, progressive, I think. In in when you look at the City Council of of Los Angeles, uh, there was a recall effort against him. Let's play this clip. The recall effort against LA City Councilman Mike Bonin has failed. The LA City Clerk's Office reports the recall petition gathered 25,965 signatures, and that is more than 1,300 short of the requirement. Bonin issued a statement yesterday reading in part, quote, today is the end to a long wasteful abuse of the electoral process organized by obstructionists who oppose homeless housing and staffed by right-wing operatives trying to weaken progressives new at noon so i wanted to bring that up because um he is one of the more progressive uh members and he has as they said fight, fought for fought against real estate in particular um support bernie sanders uh fought for for homeless housing which is of course an issue everywhere 
But in, in California right now, there's like this insane effort by the right wing. I mean, on one hand, you have the, the, the Democratic establishment who's just constantly at war with progressives. But then you have the right wing who's like teaming up with the establishment with these insane recalls in some ways. And, and it's, you know, there's, there's a, we're, we're fighting like the corporate Democrats and then we're fighting QAnon supporters running for office. It's, it's almost too much to handle. Like, I'm, I'm glad that he, you know, wasn't recalled, but uh, what do you, what do you think is happening and how do we fight this? You're, you're a labor well, organizer. You're used to this. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I think that um, we need to let the Democrats fight their own fight. Even progressive Democrats are not our friends. They're not on our side. Um, we know, for example, and I've brought this up multiple times, the DSA candidate in LA City Council voted yeah. against the people's movement to fund a gentrifying developer because allegedly that was what is fair. And I think that once again, what is fair in an exploitative society is always unfair to those of us who are exploited and only fair to those of us doing the exploiting. And so if they want to recall him, let him defend himself. Mm. We need to focus on building our own independent movement that is not dependent on the so-called progressive wing of capital. Um, because as long as we continue electing these Democrats, the upsurge in American fascism is not going to go away. It's only going to continue um, growing. Well, what's interesting, I mean, I'm curious, did, did DSA retract their endorsement? Because we've had that in in New York happen. I mean, and that's, that's again, it's like, we give you power, now we're taking it back. They didn't. No, they, they chose did not, not to, or they, was this a question that was brought up? I'm not aware if it was brought up, but I know that they did not retract their endorsement. But I, again, I think once again, it just shows the um, the uh, sort of futility or, you know, it's not going to work. Electing Democrats is simply not going to change anything except the PR material. There's going to be trans flags, gay flags and BLM flags, but it's the same policies. Well, especially if leadership's the same. I mean, if if they're established until you have progressive leadership, which is not a yeah. not on the table anytime soon, because they're the ones who dictate everything, they dictate what committees yeah. are on, and so that then everybody, as a result, starts compromising on their beliefs because power, you know, once once they can smell power or losing power, if they're not in a you know important committee, they are not willing to to do what it takes. Absolutely. And I think that, again, what the task of the left is today is to understand the failure of reformism to change anything for literally anyone. Um, we could pass reforms uh, and they might be good for a couple years, but as long as the fundamental exploitative structure of our society remains, then those reforms will always be reversed. And the left needs to fight for permanent change, which can only come from a revolutionary transformation of our society away from capitalism to socialism. So um, speaking of capitalism, I want to talk a little bit about this, the, the organizing that's been happening around this country. Uh, and the coverage, frankly, because there's been very little coverage in the past of, of strikes that have occurred right before our eyes. But of course, reporters were not interested. It was not spicy enough. And now suddenly, you know, during a pandemic and the economic collapse, you have mainstream institutions covering this, but then you have new um, publications like More Perfect Union. So 40 million workers have quit. 100,000, more than 100,000 are on strike. And there are 550 new unions. That was all in 2021. Let's play this clip from start to finish. During these unprecedented times, it's difficult times, all of our Amazon retail heroes, the unsung heroes, we want to say thank, thank you. you. We want to thank you. The community stepped up and treated us like heroes, but management—they like to call us heroes, but they definitely don't treat us like such. We feed all these families, but I can't feed mine. Force overtime causes divorces. It caused people to kill themselves that used to work here. You are a number. I'm hoping for change. I'm hoping for time with our children. I'm hoping for some more money. During the pandemic, the stores were making a lot of money. That success was built on us risking our lives every day. I want to thank every Amazon employee because you guys paid for all of this. <laughs> it is a sweatshop in there. They treat them like a gigabyte in a system. Even robots break down sometimes. 
We are here to stand up for the humanity of the Amazon worker and the humanity of workers across this country. This is just the beginning. We're done giving up concession by concession. We're done being bullied by a company that makes millions and millions. Yonder makes six billion a year. Well, guess what? My dad may have carried this in 1986. We're back. We're union strong. We've got the community behind us. A wave of worker strikes sweeping across America. Bigger. Lines popping up nationwide. Right now, 800 nurses are on strike in Worcester. In Alabama, over 1,000 mine workers are on strike. And they're going to give us a good contract. We ain't going to take no bullshit. I'm so proud to be here today. Might be a little different for a Secretary of Labor coming out and saying, say, they're calling it Strike Tober. Strikes giving. We want the better pay, pension for everybody. It's not for only one group. I mean, we're looking out for the, the guys who come next. Attention, Walmart shoppers and associates. My name is Beth from Electronics. I've been working at Walmart for almost five years, and I can say that everyone here is overworked and underpaid. This job, I quit. People are quitting their jobs in droves in what's been dubbed the Great Resignation. And we all know what happened in Alabama. They sparked a fuse. We're going to bring the fight to Bezos again this year, Jeff. You're going to negotiate with us soon enough. Massive win for those John Deere employees. They waited it out. New Hope tonight for New York City struggling taxi drivers. Many have been on a two-week hunger strike. The first company-owned Starbucks to unionize. For the first time in a long while, the balance of power is shifting away from big businesses. We've been asked about how long we're willing to fight. And at the end of the day, it's going to be one day longer than they are. I mean, I'm hyped up. <laughs> but the, that one that one part of this, this ad uh, where you had Jeff Bezos saying, thank you to the Amazon workers, you paid for this penis ship to space my little like midlife crisis. Thank you so much for paying for this. Don't forget he landed that day and there was that tornado that ravaged one of his facilities and people died because they weren't allowed to leave the facility. They were told not to leave. Um, this is inspiring, of course, but well overdue. I mean, do you think the Capitol, because they're using, I mean, we've had a lot of folks on who talk about anti-insurgent uh, efforts that, you know, these firms that really crack down or union busters. Um, but some folks have said that the tactics are the same. And so the more people know about the tactics, the harder it's going to be for them to crack down. And of course, more folks are going to be inspired to unionize, to quit, to use their labor as, as a tool of power. Um, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, one, the tactics absolutely are the same, both on our side, but also on theirs. Um, you know, they might have more funding, but uh, it's always the same. Uh, captive audience meetings, intimidation, surveillance, threats. Um, and workers need to be prepared that when you go up and stand with your coworkers against the boss, your boss is going to surveil you, threaten you, make you promises, uh, incentivize you to not join the union, uh, throw you in captive audience meetings where they attempt to intimidate you. All of those things are illegal, but it doesn't mean they won't do it. And that's why workers have to be prepared to document it and prepared to talk to each other um, for what we call inoculation, which is basically getting people fight ready. When you know you're about to uh, start a union drive, you have to be ready and get your coworkers and friends ready for the retaliation that we know is coming. But it doesn't mean that we are powerless to it. Um, even under Trump's NLRB, uh, my friend who was an H&M worker, Nick Gallant, that we were organizing with, he was fired by H&M for organizing his coworkers after, you know, female coworkers were literally trapped in the building when there was a fire. Um, they were <gasps> locked doors on them, uh, wow. stealing their money. And guess what? Uh, he was fired for organizing and we fought H&M under Trump's hand-picked NLRB and we won. And if it's possible under Trump, it's definitely possible now, but you have to be militant enough and willing to see the fight through to the end. Oh, love it. Turn that into an ad. Um, okay, so on, on that note, I want to just juxtaposition here. I, like while, while I was uh, doing the ad earlier today, I, during one of the breaks, I saw this pop up on Instagram and I, I had, I just argh, had to post it because see these and it drives me crazy. This woman, um, she is an, uh, a reporter, Nina. Can you zoom in just a little bit because it's hard for me to read? 
Nina Strominger. Um, Nina Strominger said she asked Wharton students, of course, where the Trumps went, uh, business school, what they thought the average American worker makes per year. And 25% of them thought it was over six figures. One of them thought it was $800,000. That's average. Really not sure what to make of this. The real number is $45,000 per year. And even that, you know, is, is, is that full-time work? Of course, we we're just we're just putting that in context. Forty five thousand dollars a year. I, these schools are breeding little elitists. This is insane. And these yeah. are the people who are running the companies who are supposedly out of touch. They know. I mean, this one. I'm, I'm sorry. To, these are Wharton students who. This is this is this is a business school. They are looking at budgets. They should know what they're paying their workers. Once they take over, once they're the CFOs of these companies or many executives or middle management, they should be aware of what they're paying their workers. Well, you know, Nomiki, we are so we are not people to them. Workers are not people to the exploiting class in the U.S. Um, we are sacrificial uh, work robots that they will use until we're all used up, and then they'll throw us out on the streets to die, which is exactly what they did during COVID. Um, I saw this professor's tweet, and what I find even more heinous and more insidious is that she followed up saying. I don't think it really says anything about the students at Wharton. I think that uh, what it says, you know, something along the lines of most people underestimate the gap between uh, rich and poor. But that is BS. If you go to a community college in a working class neighborhood and you ask students what the average income is, I bet you anything it's going to be a lot closer to reality, if not even lower than what the actual average income is in the US. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you could have a PhD and teach at a business school and still have no idea what class means or how class manifests itself in the United States shows the failure of the academy in the U.S., mm -hmm. but also the way that it acts as a propaganda tool right. to maintain the status quo. Um, and it's, it's not that they're just unaware or ignorant. It's that we're not people to them. And it's that... Uh, you know, this is this is the ideology that they were raised on, you know? Going back to the Bezos quote, he said it, I mean, the, if, if for the podcast listeners, when you look at that part where Jeff Bezos is sitting there in his blue jumpsuit, he has astronauts and scientists next to him, some of whom are not billionaires, are not his best friends. And there was one woman that was to the right of him, who I believe is a um, it's an astronaut. She, her jaw dropped when he said that in a flippant, insulting way. Thank you to the Amazon workers who helped me do this. And her jaw dropped. Um, also jaw dropping. So simultaneously, we have government that is continuing to put means testing and austerity on Americans. And I, I, I cannot believe this story. This is Delaware. Delaware is, of course, credit card capital of the country. Delaware has all these tax breaks, and that is where uh, Joe Biden is from. So millions of Americans are facing suspended license, licenses because of outstanding debt. Debt-based suspensions trap workers in impossible situations. If they can't drive, they can't go to work and then they and pay the fees to reinstate their license. I can't believe this. Finally, there's somebody who's presenting a bill, but let's just play a little bit of this clip and uh, comment on it. That's what this is all about. It's all about money. There's a huge problem with our justice system that you've probably never heard about. Millions of Americans currently have their driver's licenses suspended due to court fines and fees that they are unable to pay. This punishment for poverty leads to lost jobs and endless cycles of debt that trap working class people in the criminal justice system. It's happened more than once. I used to be a, a drug dealer and they gave me four years in prison. And they suspended my license and gave me, I think, was a fifteen thousand dollar fine. In order to reinstate my license, I got, I think, got to pay a fee of uh, two hundred and eighty nine dollars. If you get out of jail and you don't have what it is that you need to pay, it might make someone likely to resort back to the life of crime that mm -hmm. led them into jail in the first place, and that's extremely problematic. It's a circle that is vicious. So, how do these license suspensions work? Across the country, courts fine people to punish them for crimes and charge them court fees that then fund the criminal justice system. When a person can't pay, they often have their driver's license suspended. 
you got to pay. You got to pay the court costs. I had a public defender, so I had to pay a fee for that. And mm -hmm. you don't realize that you may charge these fees. Let's say that someone is driving and a police officer picks up that they're speeding and they get pulled over for a speeding ticket. They have substance abuse disorder and he discovers a small amount of fentanyl in the car. They take a plea offer to a misdemeanor possession of, of drugs and they get sentenced to low-level probation, substance abuse uh, evaluation, um, and court costs. If you have money, you pay that off and you don't get it on your record and it's done. If you do not have money, you get put on a payment plan. If you miss one of those payments, most of the courts in Delaware then automatically suspend your driver's license. A lot of times people don't know their driver's license is suspended, so they then continue driving and then to really play this out, often get pulled over for let's say another speeding ticket and then turns into a more serious offense of driving on a suspended license. We know what obviously what the consequences are to not having a car and being able to operate in, in most of, of this country that does not have public transportation. Um, but of course, you know, this isn't just people who go to, to prison, as they mentioned, this is this is folks who might have, you know, a fee for something else, court fee, but it is extremely uh, difficult when you're coming out of being incarcerated um, or being held and you don't have, especially if you're incarceration, you know, you may not be able to access employment. And so there's all this compounding pressure. Can't go back. If you're in public housing, you can't go back and live there, by the way. Um, it's very, very difficult. And, and then, you know, we wonder why we have, uh, this is, this is, uh, it's, it's a racket. It's like a giant racket, man. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually really horrible. And and there's two things that come up for me for this. Mm -hmm. um, the first is that, you know, this is what it looks like to live under a dictatorship, not the kind of dictatorship the U.S. ruling class wants to scare us about, the facade they've turned the DPRK into or other countries. I'm talking about the dictatorship of capital. Okay, um, wage theft is the most common form of theft in the country, and yet employers face no consequences to it. They don't have their licenses revoked. They don't have their ability to travel revoked. Uh, all of their rights and privileges are maintained, despite the billions of dollars that they steal from workers every single year. And yet those of us who are working class are the ones who are facing these burdens and these problems. Mm -hmm. We have to understand this is a dictatorship of capital. And until we fundamentally change which class is, is in power, these things are going to keep happening. And then the second thing is, you know, Brett from Rev Left Radio made mm -hmm. a very uh, accurate uh, comment, in my opinion, which is that, uh, right now, the U.S. is in decline, um, and I think we all see it, right? I'm 30 now. The world is not the same as it was when I was 18. It's a lot different, and it's a lot worse. Mm -hmm. And the only way for the U.S. to save itself while maintaining its basic class structure is to embrace social democracy. But it's not going to do that. What it's going to do is continue to push austerity uh, until we enter, in my opinion, full barbarism. And I think we see this already happening with COVID and mm -hmm. this is the model that's gonna be used as climate and other sort of so-called natural catastrophes continue to plague us. Um, and it's horrifying because if they don't have workers uh, to, to, to produce, I mean, if we're a consumer-based economy in, in capitalism and they're so flippant about workers um, and workers can't consume because they don't have jobs. I just don't understand how they see this playing out. It, it's, it's barbarism is a, an accurate way of saying it. And um, great to end on a bright note. <laughs> barbarism, get ready. <laughs> unless we want to organize for something better, which we absolutely can do. And that's why I think every single viewer really has to find it in themselves to get connected with other people, join an organization, mm -hmm. and tap into this fight. Absolutely. Esperanza Fonseca, you're like a preacher. Thank you. Thank you, Nomiki. <laughs> you're like a, a commie preacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm just an organizer. And if there's know, one <laughs> thing I could do is just inspire people to just tap into this fight because we need everyone. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much for joining us um, as always and happy Fun Friday to everybody. Uh, make sure to check out the show on Tuesday. We do, um, excuse me, yes, Tuesday. God, I'm forgetting. We do TNS Live where we have longer sit-down conversations at 8 p.m. starting off on Rockfin and YouTube, but we finish it off on rockfin.com slash Nomi Key. And of course, check out the show on Wednesday and Friday. Thank you to everybody for joining us. And as always, stay in solidarity. The no show. Clash momentarily for clash solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from a leech, oligarch, stay fed, deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and it's melted by we live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights, highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. continues. The no Mickey show. show.